say good evening, Restoration Chapel, and all the family that has joined us. We thank you so much for being here today. Um, this is part of our Traveling uh, Stories series, and we have been blessed by having the Associate Pastor at Rock Hill, also the State Youth, Co-State Youth Director, uh, Chris Galloway. He is not a stranger to Restoration Chapel. Um, we all, he comes and be, be with us a lot. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and a great man of God. And we welcome you, Pastor Chris. Uh, we Thank hope you're doing well. Yes, sir. Doing very well. That's great. That's great. And um, Pastor Chris, him and his wife, Brandy, just moved to Rock Hill, what, in December, January-ish? We actually moved up January the 1st. January 1st. Okay. Was, yeah, so that was the date. And they're two boys, and they've been up there uh, serving as associate pastor before that. He was youth pastor um, at... Uh, Piedmont Church of God of Prophecy. He's also spent some time at College Park working with some things there, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I went there a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and we, while I was, during that time, he became state youth director almost a year now. Wow. And then crazy. That's crazy. So, That's crazy. Uh, but uh, we're excited to have him on, and I'm going to start him off with a question that we've been starting off with all our, our guests is, what was your life before you had an encounter with Jesus Christ? Oh, wow. That's a big one for me. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, life before Jesus was, uh, it was chaos. It was crazy. It was confusion. Um, just, uh, you know, like anyone else, just a lost soul trying to find a way. Um, but how I grew up, we didn't really do Jesus. We didn't really do church. So, um, a lot of confusion, trying to figure out life, um, looking for clear direction. And, um, you know, you always find yourself questioning, you know, why are you here? Is there a purpose? Uh, what's going on? And so uh, for me, I, I think the biggest things were probably chaos and confusion, uh, mostly. A lot of searching, a lot of searching. That's what I would say, a lot of searching, uh, trying to find something so your family didn't grow up in church like you said am i correct yeah no uh we didn't we didn't do church at all my mom and dad um they didn't do church at all my grandparents actually were the first ones that started taking us to church so uh we would go visit sometime or they would pick us up you know once in a while and they would take us into the church so that's kind of where we uh learned about it but uh no no family members um it, it just wasn't you know part of their life which is which is great because um and uh, I I think about uh, we as, in my life I've come across a lot of people where family wasn't in church mm -hmm. uh, a friend might have invited them to youth group or um, they seen something on Facebook or they just showed up you know right <laughs> for yeah. some reason there was nothing else to do um, so they just showed up at a service somewhere you know um, and, and so I want to let you know there is hope even even if you're not grown up in this. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I think as Christians, we take for granted that not everybody has grown up in church. Um, not everybody knows the uh, children's church stories. Am I correct? That's right. Like this, you know, that's right. Uh, and we need to realize that um, as we go out and tell the world our testimony, um, we need to make sure we let them know that, hey, not everybody has grown up in this. So don't be so vague. Am I correct? That, um, that's right. And, and expect uh, people to know. Yeah, that's uh, when I was doing youth ministry and something I still do now is uh, I tell folks, I always go in assuming nobody knows. Uh, and, you know, there's those ones, you know, that they grew up in it, you know, that they know. But uh, I, I just keep that in my mind. I just I don't take for granted that everyone just knows the stories and knows what's going on. Because, uh, you know, especially doing youth ministry, I, I used to have a kid. I would tell them stories in the Bible and I would just do it as a brief overview thinking, man, everyone's heard this story and they would stop me and be like, whoa, you got to explain what's going on here. You know, I never heard this before. Definitely. Uh, I, and so. you know, and, and I, I remember talking to a kid one time about uh, um, Balaam and the talking donkey and I would bring that up and I would do Like you said, a quick summary of it, man. That's how that donkey talked, you know? And then yeah. I have people stop and say, you're talking about the movie Shrek, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, what? So, yeah, like you said, we can't expect everybody to know, uh, you know, those stories that we grew up on. And mm -hmm. so when we come and speak to people, we need to understand that. Um, and, and, and I hate to say it, sometimes we try to use those big words, you know, 
even, you know, when I speak as a pastor, you know, sanctification, that's not a big word to me, but to somebody that don't even know what salvation is, yeah. you that's know, we, we need to make sure. So, so you grew up not knowing, uh, uh, really, you know, soul searching, not really knowing the God thing, you, you, Jesus. Right. Uh, do you remember what got you to come to church? I know you said grandparents, but what got you to come at a constant uh, time? Uh, yeah. So, well, I mean, just honestly, I met, uh, my brother, first of all, I'd say my brother started going to church. He actually started going to church, got a prophecy. Some friends invited him, um, to the Piedmont church actually. Mm -hmm. And so he went and I went there and, uh, I met a couple of friends. Um, there was a little girl that I liked, thought she was pretty. And <laughs> so, uh, I started going, you know, I just started going to church. Um, and I quickly realized something was different. Like, yeah. you know, uh, I thought there's no way people are just this nice. There's got to be something to this. And uh, so it was It was mostly just friends and the little girl that I liked and wanted to try and get to know a little bit. Um, but that pulled me in. Definitely. And, and, and I, I like that because I've heard you say that before. I've heard you mention that. And the reason why I say that is because so many people think, well, they're coming for the wrong reasons because you got food or because you have, uh, games or something like that but you never know what could happen yeah you never know one thing my youth pastor did uh you know people would say he bribed us but we wanted to go to camp we wanted to go to different things and so he would make a schedule of how many services were between these events and he would say hey if you want to go to this event you have to come to church you know x amount of times and uh, a lot of times you know for me um, i wasn't saved i didn't know anything about it but i wanted to go to that event and so I would go to church, you know, um, but I say, Hey, let them come. Definitely. Once it gets inside of you, man, everything changes. That's right. That's right. And do you remember the day that you actually had that encounter with Christ? Uh, I do. I remember it being, and it wasn't in the church. Uh, it was at actually one of uh, the camp services, my first encounter. Uh, I remember his name was Steve Wilson. I think he's passed on now, uh, but he was the youth pastor at the Somerville church um, some years back. And uh, he was preaching and he had this ladder up and he was climbing this ladder and he was talking about trying to see Jesus. And I don't even remember the whole story he was talking about, but uh, just sitting there, man, I just started thinking about it and going through all the people that I had met, that how different they were and, you know, all the stories that I was hearing. And uh, so I just thought to myself, you know, I was feeling it. And so uh, they said, if you were feeling it, get up, come down and pray. And so uh, I decided right then that, you know, I was going to go and uh, if it was real, I was about to try it. And so, man, I got up and went down and prayed and uh, God really moved on my heart uh, that day, did something special for me. Now, do you, do you feel like it was just that moment or do you feel like it, it had been working up to that moment? No, I think it was more of a, a working up thing because for me, I was real shy, very reserved. I, and a lot of people don't even believe that, but I, I was real reserved, real shy, um, almost embarrassed to get up and go. And so I'd go in churches and we'd go in services and I would always feel something, uh, but I never would move. Uh, I never really wanted to pray because I didn't want people to hear me praying. I didn't want to go down to the altar because then everybody was going to be staring at me. And so, uh, but I knew that something was going on inside. And every time we would have youth group, every time we would go to an event and I would just feel this strong pull. Um, and so, no, I, I definitely think it was a building process where God was just, uh, I, I like to say it like he was tearing down the things in me that needed to be tore down so that when I did get up and go down there, it wasn't just an emotional experience. Uh, that something could really happen in my life. Definitely. Now, um, now afterwards, because I and and I tell young people this all the time, and and I know you will answer this, you know. Um, but afterwards, it's not you feel great. I mean, your life has changed. Yeah. But then it seems like you get home from camp or you get home from service, and then it their life's right. still there. Mm -hmm. um, am I correct with that? I mean, absolutely. There's still a battle there, correct? There, there's an absolute battle uh, that goes on because it's what you said in that moment, man, you feel great. You feel like the world has been taken off your shoulders and everybody around you in, in these atmospheres, a lot of times, whether it's camp or uh, if it is in just a church setting, a lot of times, you know, the people around you, they're cheering you on, they're praying for you. 
but then I would go home. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, my family, they weren't much on this. So when you go home and you want to start sharing the experience, everybody doesn't really want to hear it. Yeah. And so uh, you just kind of settle back into your everyday routine. Um, and that's why I said I believe that it was the building process for me that God was tearing down things because he knows you're going back into real life. Uh, he knows you're going back to where you came from. And so there has to be that thing that happens inside of you that when you get back around it, you know, it doesn't just turn it off completely. Definitely. And in those times where you felt like, um, cause, um, I can imagine, you know, you go, you want to go home and tell everybody and, and tell mom that, you know, everybody, your possibly grandma, grandpa, the man on the side of the street, tell everybody. And yeah. sometimes, like you said, it feels like nobody wants to listen or they listen, but it's not as big as deal as, um, you you know it is mm -hmm. how did you deal with those things i mean uh i know it had to be something on the inside but you also had to do some things on the outside too correct yeah um for me you know i would talk to i was quick on picking up on the people that didn't care to yeah. hear about it uh the ones that would kind of celebrate it and the ones that would just push it off and so for for me personally for a long time uh i only talked about it around the right people Definitely. You know, because uh, it was something that I, I was still a fragile Christian and um, my life was just starting on that path. And so um, I felt like, you know, if I kept talking to them and just getting bashed about it, then it, it was going to hurt me in the long run. And so uh, I just learned quickly who I could and could not talk to about it. Um, but, you know, nowadays I can say with great confidence that as you grow in it, um, then that kind of goes away to where it kind of goes back full circle to when you got saved and you're like, you know what, I'm going to tell everybody whether they want to hear it or not. Um, but then at that point in my life, it was more of uh, if they celebrated with me, we could talk about it. But if, if they kind of bashed it and put it down, I would just leave it alone um, for my own personal sake. And not actually leave the people alone because you were still around those people, but leave that subject Definitely. out of conversation and and you know because um when you get saved man you just see things different things just feel different uh yeah. when you see something bad happen it kind of touches your heart in a new way and and so you would you make comments about those things you know based on your new perceptions um and so i i just learned that you know i was going to be around the same people but i would choose wisely my conversations and where they would lead and, and, and like you said, sometimes we don't have to do it with our words. We just do it with our actions, our being an example type, you know, you know, and, and especially as early Christians, you know, again, like you said, not everybody's going to celebrate you. Um, and that's the reason why I always tell people, find people that will celebrate, um, celebrate the good times and also help you in the valleys of the bad times. Um, find yes. accountable partners that's going to help you during those times. But you're also going to have to live out in the world. <laughs> Um, That's right. You couldn't move out at the early age, or, you know, when you got saved. You know, it's you're going to be a part of those things, but you have to learn when to make your remarks, but live by that example Absolutely. while you're living. Correct. Yes. Yeah. It, it, instead of always just trying to bring it up, you know, in the conversation, it was uh, more of what you said. Maybe just, and for me, maybe one of the big things was like praying. Uh, we didn't pray before we eat our food, but now I felt this urgency that. Uh, you know, they told me to be respectful and to ask God thanks. And so uh, even though I knew they didn't want to hear about it, I would just go ahead and bow my head and pray for my own food and then move on uh, with a meal. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough situation, but um, it, it's one of those things where you just have to do it because the people aren't going away. You know, they're, gonna, they're still going to be in your house. They're going to be brothers, sisters, moms, dad, you know, whoever they are. They're still going to be there. So, um you just got to find a way to make it work. That's right. And as many of you know, we are, and there'll be some that's not a part of our denomination, but we're part of the Church of God of Prophecy uh, yeah. denomination. And, um, and we believe in sanctification and baptism with the Holy Ghost. We believe salvation and then comes next sanctification and then baptism with the Holy Ghost. Now, we believe that it's not all the time instant. When you get saved, you get sanctified, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. But we do believe um, that there is a... Um, greater salvation gets you to heaven don't get me wrong we we believe okay. if you don't know jesus that's where we're going to start that's where we're going to speak but do you remember the day that you were sanctified and, and baptized with the holy ghost 
Yeah, I actually, uh, I do the, the sanctification. Uh, I'm just going to be open up about that. That one, um, it really got me because, you know, sometimes it's what you said. Some people, and, and it, it does happen for some people, I feel like, you know, for them, it's kind of an instant thing where, mm-hmm. man, they're just completely changed. Their desires, their heart has changed and everything about them's changed. Um, but for me, I was more, um, it was more the process. I was really scared of that uh, because, you know, what you said earlier, the big word, uh, that stuff scared me. I didn't really understand it. Mm-hmm. And so I would hear them talk about it and I would go, oh, Lord, you know, I had this bad thought or I thought about saying this bad word or doing this bad thing, so I must not be sanctified. Um, and so I, I quickly realized that for me, it was a process that God was doing in me um, to where it was changing my thought patterns. It was changing my belief system. And um, for me, sanctification was one day I just kind of, I, I don't know, it's, it's almost like you just kind of wake up for me. I just kind of woke up into it one day and and everything had changed. The way I would think was completely different. I didn't think about the things I used to think about. Um, The words that I might would think about saying when somebody made me mad, all of a sudden, if I was angry, they just didn't even uh, register in my mind at all. Um, So I don't, I don't think there was really a a certain day, uh, but I, I do remember it being very scary for me and just always feeling like, you know, God, am I sanctified or am I ever going to be sanctified? Um, Because I thought for every person, it had to be that instantaneous, completely, you know, everything in your whole life has changed and turned this new leaf. You know, when Uh, I think about that, and when you, when you say that, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but when I think about that, I think about the scripture that says the renewing of our mind. um, Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Being transformed through the renewing of our mind. Yes. Because we live in the flesh for so long. Um, even if it's, you know, 10, 15, whenever you guys, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whenever you get saved, um, you get in, I hate to say it as a habit of living that way. Um, but when you ask Jesus into your heart, now you want to change, but you have to renew your mind to let, you know, yourself know that, Hey, I'm not what I used to be, Yeah, you know, and, and, and so that means, you know, slowly some of those things that you would do, you know, if it's saying words that, you know, doesn't glorify God, um, you would catch yourself. And then finally you get to the point where you don't have to catch yourself anymore. You just didn't do it. That's it. And, and that was the big difference for me is there was that time where uh, you, you don't even think about it. It just doesn't even register. You just yes. kind of do what you do. But now all of a sudden uh, I've went down, I've prayed, I've asked God in my heart. I know that I'm saved. and all of a sudden when something slips up, I really step back and think about it and go, whoa, uh, shouldn't have done that until what you just said, until one day um, it, it just doesn't even, it just doesn't even register that way anymore. Everything just is totally different. That's, right. That's like when you get in your car, you don't drive to Piedmont every, every day now. You, you're you doing your mind to go to Rock Hill. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, but then, you know, we baptism of the Holy Ghost and, um, and it's something big because some of us, uh, listen, I believe there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a big deal in my life. And I know it is in yours. Um, but some of us put such an emphasis on it. We make it kind of hard for especially young people um, to sure. to receive it. Or we're so holy that we get it and we don't explain it. And then the next person doesn't, you know, receive it. Yeah. Do you remember when um, you knew that you were baptized with the Holy Ghost? Do you remember that? I do, um, because I remember I had been going to church a long time. I had been praying, uh, doing everything I could possibly do to try and grow closer to God in my own uh, ways. And I remember um, at the Piedmont Church, man, it seemed like everybody was full of the Holy Ghost in there. And if you ever get a chance to go by, you'll see what I'm talking about. And not knocking them by no means, because they are full of the Holy Ghost in there. Yeah. And, uh, but they were so different. They were so loving. They were so honorable. Uh, they treated me with such respect. They always cared about me. And so uh, I had this issue where, uh, for me personally, I would think, is that even real? Uh, because sometimes they sounded crazy. Uh, and, you know, when you don't understand something, I always say you're automatically down on what you're not up on. If you don't understand it, you start putting it down, pushing it away. 
And so that's kind of what I did. Um, but I remember being at home one night uh, by myself. I lived in a single wide trailer on my granddad's property, probably 17, 18 years old. Uh, and I remember going home that night after a Wednesday night service at church. And uh, I just knelt down and I started praying. And my prayer to God was to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, I remember specifically praying and telling God, they can't all be crazy. You know, if there's one or two, maybe. But when it's this many people, I've, I've expected their lives. I've examined their words. I feel like they have pure hearts, pure motives. And uh, I see this in them. And they tell me about this power of the Holy Ghost. And so um, I just prayed, man. And uh, I, I don't remember how long I prayed. But I remember when the power of the Holy Ghost come on me, uh, there was no doubt in my mind, was it real or was it not? Because I knew that it was God. Uh, there was a speaking in tongues that happened to me. Then, you know, uh, a lot of people have different ways they say it comes about. But for me, I was in fervent prayer asking God, if it's your will, um, you know, everyone seems around me seems to have this gift. They say, uh, this is what guides your life. This is what's going to direct you. It's going to lead you in the right places. And um, so, you know, I just approached it in that way. And I was at home by myself, sitting on the couch, uh, ended up, you know, I remember being in the floor praying for a while. And uh, he, he just so graciously decided that it was the gift that he wanted to give to me. And, and so he baptized me with it. Um, but I've never been one to really, I believe everyone should be baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I never really pushed that on people because for me, it was such a scary thing. Uh, I've dealt with plenty of kids, teenagers that, you know, you begin telling them about it and they're like, I'm out. I don't want no part of that. Um, and, and it's something scary to them. So I don't push it on people, but I do tell them it's very real. Definitely. And and it's a free thing. God will give it to you when he desires, um, but you just have to earnestly seek after him. Definitely. Uh, but, but I do remember I was by myself. And uh, after that day, you know, something new again, after, you know, like being saved, I felt so different. And then when I finally knew that my mind was transformed and I could live in what they call sanctification, uh, I, all this stuff was changing. But again, when I received that baptism of the Holy Ghost, I remember it was all exciting all over again. I remember going back to church and telling the pastor. Uh, I remember telling the pastor's daughter, everybody on the praise team. Like, I just couldn't tell enough people what God had done for me. Um, and that's another one of those things, man. It will change you. Definitely. And, and I love it because I, I want people to understand the presence of God doesn't stop at the church. Like you said, you went to your house. Yes. Um, no pastor there. Um, no Sunday school teacher. You didn't call anybody that night and say, hey, pray for me. No. You knew, hey, I'm, I'm seeking after this. And that's the yeah. reason why we need to seek so much outside the building, not just inside the building. Yeah. Because for me, um, I mean, you know, just I love to be honest with people. You know that. Restoration Chapel knows that. I'm just honest. <laughs> guy. But for me, man, I was, I was like a skeptic of the whole deal. And if I would have called the pastor and he would have prayed, then that would have always been in the back of my mind that, you know, maybe, maybe it was the pastor or if some, if it would have had to have the group of people, then for me, you know, I would have found a way to try to justify it as if it wasn't God. But I knew right there in the comfort of my house by myself at the young age, I was that, you know what, if it's you, God, then you're going to show me. Um, and I'll be proven for the rest of my life. And, and I, I, I think he just gracefully did it for me that way because um, God is sovereign and yeah. he knows that if he did it for me in that way, that that would be a d defining moment in my life that would show me that forever, you know, he holds the power. Definitely. And, and again, like I said, I love that because I, I want our, whoever watches us to know, you know, sometimes, you know, it's going to take us seeking him outside the building. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, not, you know, a lot of times we get that emotional high, um, as I like to call it. You know, we got the flashing lights, we got the smoke, we got a pastor up there who's excited, climbing yeah. ladders or shooting off confetti guns or, or uh, you know, yelling and, and it, the bright music's playing. I've heard mm -hmm. people say, if they play that song, I'm going to the altar. 
Um, yeah. you probably heard the same thing, you know. Um, youth camp or youth retreat, I think about, you know, it, it, the atmosphere is awesome. And those right. times you can give your life to God. It's amazing that we, we see so many people come and give their life to God during those uh, those events or, or experiences. But yes. sometimes it takes you by yourself in your prayer closet, in your living room, you know, that kind of thing, just seeking after God. Say, listen, God, I want to know. I want this. I, I, I want more of this. That's right. And, and I think we have to get, I know I've got many of my pastor friends that have said their times where they felt closest to God was not in the church building. It was at their house alone by themselves yeah. or, you know, those type of things. And, and, and I wanted to make sure we get that across, you know. So now that you're saved, now you're sanctified, now you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, uh, do you remember your call into the ministry? I, I remember before you were in the ministry, um, I, I think I was a youth pastor at the time, and I might have been at an event or something like that, and y'all were there. Um, we didn't really talk as much then, um, but uh, we. Uh, um, I remember when I heard, hey, well, Chris Galloway is going to be the youth pastor here, there, you know, I'm like, Oh my goodness. Um, and that's how we got connected more that way. Um, but do you remember the calling into the ministry? Uh, yeah, I do. And, and for me, it was more, uh, it, it was another time that um, I was just praying and really seeking God. Um, I always have had this heart for the outcast, for, you know, the drug addict, the person that's cast to the side. And maybe it's because, you know, I grew up in such a bad situation. I was around so much of, you know, just dysfunction growing up that I just had this this place in my heart. And um, sometimes, you know, I would, I'd be around people and they'd be in a position and we'd get around the hurting folk or somebody that had a problem and, and they would almost push them away because of whatever the issue might be. And it bothered me so much. And I would go home and I would just pray about it. And uh, I just vividly remember praying in a youth service, um, actually, with Jimmy Butts, if you know who he is. Uh, mm -hmm. But we were praying about it. And uh, he just opened his eyes and looked at me. And he was like, God said, you're going to be the youth pastor of this church. There were between that statement that he made, because when he made the statement, something happened in my heart. The first thing that happened was fear. And I was like, absolutely not going to happen. Not me. You got the wrong guy. Not interested. Um, but then another thing happened is every time I would pray and tell God, there's this specific group of people that I want you to reach that if I could help in them and he would just keep placing it in my heart, it's your job. You're going to reach this group or you're going to go that direction. And um, there were several uh, after that point, there were probably three maybe even four youth pastors of the church uh, before I ever came along into it. Um, but I've just vividly remember him opening his eyes and telling me that, and he had no idea because I wasn't telling people that I was praying to God, asking them if there was a way that I could help, if there was something I could do. And it wasn't, I didn't want to reach them. Like that wasn't the goal. It wasn't for me to reach them. I was just praying, God, if I can talk to this person and they can go out and reach them. That's what I want you to do. Um, and he just put it in my heart that that I was going to be the person to do it. Definitely. And and I know and um, I know Chris very well from our times together. Um, but I know him to be the type that you don't have to have a title to minister. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. Um, right. You know. You know. People don't have to know. Um, um, I know I said I introduced him as the state co-state youth director, and I give him a hard time about it because I tell everybody all the time I'm friends with the co-state youth director. Um, but uh, I know for a fact that he's never asked for those positions, but God has laid it on his heart to minister. And when yeah. you when God lays that onto your heart and you begin to do those things, then he opens up bigger opportunities. Uh, not saying that, a, that you know, a, a drug dealer on the side of the street is not an opportunity. No, but he's giving you ways to reach bigger crowds, bigger, not crowds, Absolutely. but more people. More people. Correct? Yeah. A, a greater influence. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something, you know, is there's people everywhere that you go. And so uh, I, I've just learned that as I submit and I ask God, then he'll open the doors. Um, I live by, and sometimes people think it's crazy, but I tell, I teach a theology that says if God put it in front of you, 
he probably wanted you to do something about it. And so uh, he's going to call us into these different areas, but it's going to be up to us to walk, walk into it. Yeah. Um, but interesting, you said, I never asked for any of these positions. When, when the guy first told me, you're going to be the youth pastor of this church, I thought, you're crazy. Um, and so when the person told me, you know, hey, you're going to be a worship leader of this little deal over here, I thought not going to happen. And, uh, and, and I can say even true to this day, you know, I have a couple of titles. Uh, you said it best. I could, you know, I thank God for them and uh, he's gracefully given them to me, but I could care less about a title. It's, it's not about that to me. Um, but God has graciously given them to me. I've never ask a person to preach in a church. I've never asked to sing a song. I've never asked uh, to lead in any capacity. It has always been someone has called me into an office or someone has called my phone and said, hey man, God uh, put this, e even where I'm sitting today in Rock Hill, um, you know, I told you when they called me, I was like, man, I don't even know these people. <laughs> I don't know anything about them. Uh, I had heard stories, but I didn't know anything about them. And um, little did Brother Baker, who actually approached me, he didn't know what I was praying at the time, but God put me in his heart because he didn't really know me either. But then he just showed up, uh, gave me a phone call. We talked for a little bit. I came in, I met them all, and, and God just completely opened up. And, and that's how it's been. Uh, my entire ministry has been just grounded on that simple fact that uh, if God has an opportunity or God has a door, he will open it. Because sometimes I think our, our, our deal in ministry is we feel that call and we feel that tug into ministry. So we go kicking down every door that we see. You know, uh, people say, if you see an opportunity, jump in and help. I agree, jump in and help. Jump in and help don't mean, you know, you have to be the leader. Of, and, and so I think sometimes uh, that's what's kept me grounded and humbled is that I've never asked a thing. God has just always opened it up based on, I believe, based on obedience and based on his will uh, in the calling that you accept. Definitely. And, and I'll say this, and, and I know you'll agree with this. Even as a minister, we're only ministering one, two, three, four, five hours in the church building alone. Your yeah. ministry is more outside the building than it is inside the building. Absolutely. And when you're called, you're not called just for the preaching of an hour or two hours or the three hours. You're called um, to see the needs of the community that God has put you in or yeah. the needs that you come across. As you said, you could be driving down the street and see a need. Um, you know, I, I always wish I was a mechanic because I would definitely stop by every car that was broke down to try to fix it. But if I stopped right now, they they'd look at me and be like, you made it worse. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying though? It's he put these opportunities in front of us mm -hmm. and he's gonna, and, and we've got to, as a minister, don't think, Oh, well, I'm only the one that preaches on Sunday or Sunday night or Wednesday right. or teaches in a class or leads worship. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you can't bring your guitar out um, on the side of the road and just start playing what well, you can, but but you know what I mean? You just, yeah. it, it's not that way. And you've got, like you said, whatever God puts in front of you, that's your ministry. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and first it starts at home, wherever you're, wherever you are at home. If you're married, it starts with your wife. And if you have kids, right. it starts with your kids. If you're not married yet, you're, you're living at home with your parents, then it's your parents. Um, but it starts there to, to minister yeah. there. Um, now I know, um, and I hadn't brought this up yet, but I know you do praise and worship also. Yeah, that's a big part of your life. Um, music and ministry uh, is a big deal. Um, can you tell me how those connect together? Connect together. Yes. Uh, for me, the music is, you know, uh, music naturally doesn't even have to be Christian music. It naturally, it gets you emotional. Uh, you know, like I had a buddy, uh, I won't say his name, but man, he'd turn on these rock and roll songs he'd get a speeding ticket every time he'd turn on, <laughs> because he'd go so fast. And I said, dude, why'd you do that? And he's like, man, I just got into the song. Um, same thing, you know, sad songs make you sad sometimes. And so for me, the music part is so important in the church because it ties into the atmosphere of what you're doing. I, I don't believe in making people emotional, but I definitely believe there's something special about uh, a lot of the worship songs, hymnals, 
um, you, you know me, I don't care what they are, as long as they're biblically sound and you got halfway decent musicians playing them, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I can get down with it. But I believe there's something special about, uh, there's a couple of things that go on. Uh, one is that you're crying out from your lips to God. Uh, sometimes people don't do that on their own. Maybe these songs are the only times that they are actually crying out to God. And, and a lot of the lyrics that we sing, they put us, the second thing is they put you in that mindset that as what you're singing, you start thinking about that. Um, and I'm just a person that believes the more you call on God, the more you dwell on God, the more he opens up and reveals himself. Okay. And so um, I think that the worship is so important and the music is so important because it sets a certain atmosphere. Um, now I can say it with great boldness because that's what I do. Um, I've been in places, you know, where they sing and it kind of hindered the yeah. atmosphere or kind of broke it down. And I've been in places where uh, one of the best things I can say is I went to uh, Tampa Bay and um, I was down, I was actually visiting my wife's mom and uh, I'm a weird church got a prophecy person. When I go on vacation, if it becomes Sunday, I start Googling churches and uh, I find the church got a prophecy in the area and I go. And so uh, I found this church in Tampa Bay, which was probably 20 minutes from where my wife's mom lived. And so I drove over to that church. And what I noticed quickly when I got there was they didn't have a lot of instruments on the stage, but they had a pretty big stage. Um, but I seen a drum set and I think a piano. Um, and so when they got up there, they got ready to sing. No one played the piano, but somebody went and sat down on the drums. So they had a drummer and a lady standing in front to sing. But when she started singing, something happened in that place. Man, the atmosphere just shifted and the presence of God just showed up in such a crazy way. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important because it, it just sets a tone. And I, I believe it moves the heart of God because it moves you into that mindset. Um, the lyrics move your mind, they move your heart. And therefore, you know, when you're dwelling on him and when you're calling on him, that's, that's what God asked us to do. You know, yep. he asked us to dwell on him. He asked us to cry out to him. And, and when we're doing those things, that's when he's showing up. Um, so if we're not having music in ministry, I think you're missing. Um, I think you're missing a big part of setting an atmosphere for God to do something special uh, in people's lives. If I'm not mistaken, um, it was in second Kings, Elisha, the Kings come to him and they're about to end up be in a battle and, and they're losing the battle and they come to Elisha and they're like, Hey, you know, Elisha, help us out. You're the man of God. And like, yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, Elisha first, he kind of smart aleck. He says, now you come to me. Uh, you know, and, and then he says, okay, now bring me a harp. Yes. And, and a lot of people kind of miss that little spot. If I'm not mistaken, Stephen Furtick brought this up or there was another pastor that brought it up that said the reason why he did that was to bring a atmosphere to yeah, change the atmosphere sure. in our lives, you know, so you could have a rough morning, and you go in and you hear a word or hear a song that kind of brings your emotions. And the thing about emotions is emotion shows what you care about. If you get emotional about it, that's what you care about. I mean, you know, if you get sad, you know, you know, if something happens in your life and you don't get sad about, it, you really didn't care about it. I mean, it really didn't matter to you. But if, if you get sad about it, then that's something that, you know, it's touches your heart. So it brings you back into the atmosphere, just like you said. I and um, and I totally agree. You know, I agree with the atmosphere. We we need to bring that atmosphere because that that sets the mood. I won't say sets the mood, but sets the the world around us to say, hey, um, no matter what's going on around us, we're gonna go and worship God and praise Him. Yeah, and, and I think it helps everyone to get in one mindset. Um, that's why I tell people, you know, they they laugh at me, but I tell them. That's why there's so many different types of churches because there's so many different types of people. That's why there's so many different types of music uh, in the churches because wherever you are in whatever church you're in, uh, one thing I believe is that you should be able to get in the same mindset with them. And when you're sharing in this worship song, uh, whatever style or, or whatever, you know, whatever kind of music it might be, uh, as long as you can share in that, then it brings the people into one mindset 
that, you know, they're thinking about God. And, and, you know, if you're right with God, you're thinking about how much you love him, how much you honor him. And two, the, there's a very real part that if you're not right with him, you're singing about it, you're thinking about it, and a conviction comes on you to where he can move in and do something. Uh, I've seen people get saved. One of, you know, one of the ministries that I love to follow a lot, uh, one of the bigger name pastors that I follow, um, every altar service, every time people are getting saved in their church, it's before the preaching ever happens. It is directly after their praise and worship mm -hmm. because something happens in people's hearts and minds during that time. Uh, and, and sometimes it is, you know, we have to be honest, sometimes it's just emotional and they get into it. But more than that, you know, it's God working on people and it, it's his whole presence opening up to you. Uh, so I, I just think it's just so important, you know, that we're singing worship songs, not necessarily a certain type, you know, whether you sing <laughs> old songs or new songs. I tell folks, uh, I've been in churches where they sing nothing but old songs. And man, the presence of God will come in there and it'll hammer you straight to the floor. Uh, I've been in places where they sing nothing but new songs and, and the same thing. You know, God doesn't have a preference of song. I don't think he cares. It's more about your heart and your mindset. Definitely. Uh, in those moments. Definitely. I apologize. There's a helicopter going over. So if you hear a little noise, that's what it is. Um, but <laughs> with that being said, um, with, uh, you know, we've talked about being saved. We talked about, you know, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost. We talked about uh, being called into the ministry. We've talked about worship. Um, and I was going to, and, and I, and I, when we were prepping, I gave you this question if you had one word to, or one message or one scripture or one Bible story that you could tell you're preaching a service, people are saved or just gave their life to God, what would that message be? Um, that, for me, that's an easy, easy thing to talk about because it, for me, the word is proximity. It, the word is closeness. Um, for me, that is the biggest thing. That's what I try to teach more than anything. Um, that's what I try to show to people more than anything is there has to be that closeness with God. Um, you know, you, you got to surround yourself with the right people. you got to get in the right atmospheres. But at the end of the day, um, you may not be around the right people. You may not find the right atmosphere. It may just be you by yourself. And a lot of times in life, you're going to find yourself in the hardest moments of life going to be alone. And so the biggest thing I teach people when they get saved, uh, when they're just starting on their journey with God is you have to find him yourself every day. And sometimes people, you know, that's where they, they say, man, that Galloway, he's a little holy on that deal, right? A little serious. <laughs> uh, because I tell them you have to seek God every day. You can't just talk about it. You can't just, you know, go out and, and, and try to live your life without them. You have to actually get up. Uh, I, I ask people all the time, my biggest thing is proximity and closeness with God. And so people will be telling me, you know, they'll be expressing things to me in, in different situations. And I always say, have you prayed about it? And they'll say, well, yeah, I, I prayed. And then I follow up with, have you prayed about it? How the Bible teaches you to pray about issues. And uh, they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, well, I pray. And they'll give me this list. You know, I have people that say, I pray every day when I'm driving down the road. Nothing wrong with praying while you're driving down the road, but how close can you really get and how personal can you really get when you're focused on not crashing your car, right? <laughs> because yeah, that's, that's kind of important not to crash. Um, so I tell them, you know, the Bible teaches you that you go into a room and that you close a door and that you earnestly seek after God. And, and you know, James teaches us that when we earnestly seek after him, he shows up. And so that is the thing that I want to teach people and that I try to teach people more than anything is that every day of your life, not just, you know, while you're driving down the road, I think that's cop out. Uh, I want you to pray while you're driving down the road, but if that is your prayer time for the day, I think you've not really given God your all. Um, you know, I know people get busy, so, you know, life happens, but I, I tell folks all the time, uh, you have time and you have money for what you want to have time and money for right we all can make it happen if it's five minutes if it's 55 minutes whatever it is you have to get up every day and find time for god um, because without that you know you can get lost in this thing easy uh, i've been around church a long time sometimes uh, i've 
done it the right way. Sometimes I've done it the wrong way. Sometimes people taught me the right way. Sometimes they taught me the wrong way. Uh, I've had some of the most cheerful moments and some of the most hurtful moments. Uh, but the one constant that keeps me going through every situation is that I personally have a closeness with God that I get up every day of my life and I find time before I go back to sleep, I find the time to close a door, be alone, and actually just cry out to God in my own way. Uh, and for me, that way is lifting up my voice and actually verbally crying out to him. Um, but the biggest thing you can do for your relationship with God is, is just draw close, draw close. Uh, and, and two, I don't remember exactly, but there's the scripture, the scripture teaches you that. It teaches you that as you draw close to God, then he draws into you. And he, it says that he reveals himself or opens himself up to you. Yep. And so as you're doing that daily, you know, prayer time, um, I, I think you find it. Um, and, and so I guess it would be proximity, be closeness to God on a personal level. Uh, because for me, man, I've just been around enough people that that's where they're missing out uh, with what God's trying to do in their life. Um, sometimes us as ministers, you know, we get into a place where we can pray for everybody else throughout the day, but we didn't pray for ourselves, yep. And then we end up like, God, what's going on in my ministry? Um, but when we really sit down and evaluate it, have we actually got alone and just spent that personal time with him? Um, because I've learned in my short life that, as I spend personal time with him, he reveals and he opens up things to me um, that, you know, most of the time it couldn't just come from a person. It's got to be a God thing. Um, so if you just got saved, if you just started the journey, uh, that's my advice to you is, is find a way to get close to God every day of your life. Definitely. It's just like, you know, when you start a relationship with a spouse or a, uh, or somebody you want to be spend more time with them so you can find out like you said more about them or, yeah. or like the um i don't i guess it's considered older now worship song um the more i seek you the more i find you the more i find you the more i love you that that and that is that is the perfect example because that's you know i was thinking when you said the relationship uh the problem is is um and, and you've heard me even preach about it i'm sure is the problem is we become familiar definitely with the whole God thing, we've become familiar with the whole Jesus thing. And so uh, there's not that real need to pray every day, study every day. Um, and so, you know, as you, as you do pray more and seek him out and try to draw closer every day, then the more you want to get closer. Be because once you've been in the presence of God, you know, nothing else is, is the same. I mean, it, it's, it's totally, totally a new world. Definitely. And I think that's a great word, especially for right now, the time that we're recording this. Um, we're going through sure. this, uh, this, you know, sickness that's going around. Um, we hadn't been able to meet into the churches. We hadn't been able to, you know, be, uh, I, I seen a stat yesterday where 40, 48% of churchgoers have not watched one online service. And, you know, and it makes you begin to think, hey, yeah, we have to have this time by ourselves because if we don't, we're going to lose out on that relationship mm -hmm. with God, you know, and, and I don't want to say lose out, but we're going to get, we're, we're, we think we're familiar with God until something goes on in our life and we understand that I didn't prepare. Right. I hadn't but, built the faith to be able to withstand right. whatever I'm going through because it was always dependent on being in around the right people or being that's in right. the church that's right um, and, and that's why i teach people you i, I tell them you got to seek god more at home than you do at church definitely and that sounds rough and sometimes the preachers look and go you just said that but it's so true uh, i think you're seeking more at your house you know uh, i tell them jesus man look at jesus he gave you the perfect model of what i'm talking about and that's where i got it from is studying scripture and I always found Jesus, he would be slipping away from crowds and going off to pray. He would, he, they would talk about he's going out alone to pray. Uh, he left this group and he prayed. And so we see this beautiful model of the Savior getting away from everybody, isolating himself with God, uh, getting in tune with the Father. And then this miraculous thing happens that when he goes back out and gets around people, 
he's just speaking words and yeah. things are happening and, and lives are just being transformed. And, you know, he didn't have to go through all the process that we sometimes try to go through in ministry. And, and I really believe it's because he spent that close time alone with God, that God was able to put something in him that now he went out. And when he speaks, they truly hear the father speak because it's in him. Uh, and so that's, that's the model that I, I gain it from. It, it is Jesus. Yeah, it's and usually, and usually when he slips away, as you said, he not only speaks and miracles happen, but if you look, he slips away for 40 days and then the devil comes to tempt him or he, he goes up on the mountain to pray. And then they're saying, Hey, we're going to go get the boat ready. Disciples, they get the boat ready. He goes down to sleep and then the storm comes ahead. But yep. um, as our, our associate pastor, Jeff Lyle says, it's better to uh, prepare than to repair because of those oh, times, good. because of those times of prayer, because of those times of seeking after the Father, um, what did he do in the Garden of Gethsemane? He went and he prayed because he knew that this was coming up. You know, this was a hard time, but he seeked after the will of God. Yeah. And, and like you said, if we want to spend time with God, we need to spend time with God seeking after Him, so that when the storms come or the opportunities come to minister, or yeah. Um, you won't have to be rah rah at church to worship. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like our our worship leaders sometimes become cheerleaders because they're like, okay, guys, stand up. Let's go. Let's go. You know, right. but it wouldn't have to be that way because we're already, as you said, in that presence of God before we ever get to the church building or before the trial comes or before the, um, you know, back in February, uh, you know, everything was great. We're going to church. We're worshiping God. And by the end of March, by the end of March, everything shut down. Uh, yeah. You know, so we have to be ready. And the only way we can be ready is, as you said, take that time to seek after God. Always be um, in the right. I, I think about uh, some of the disciples, wherever Jesus went, a couple of them always were with him. I mean, they, they were always there. Right. They were yeah. always there. Um, even when he was in the tomb, what was it? Mary and Martha was at the, at the tomb. I mean, he was there. They, they, you know, yeah. he's supposed to be dead, but they were going there, you know, yeah. and because they understood, you know, being with Jesus is better than being without him. Right. Right. And, and I think and when we give our lives over to God, we, we need to understand that also in our life. Yeah. Most important part is, is that it's having, you know, we call it the personal relationship. Uh, I tell people that sometimes, you know, we call it a personal relationship, but we treat it like a public relationship. You know, it's got to be corporate or nothing at all. Um, but it, it truly has to be the personal part of it. And, and it's for our own benefit. You know, you were saying that and I was thinking about, you know, there's there's the story in the Bible where Jesus is going off to pray and he tells the disciples, you stay right here and you watch me. And he, and he actually said, watch him pray so you don't fall into temptation. And he goes off to pray. He comes back there asleep. And that happened a series of times. Um, but that just, you know, something just hit me in my heart when I read that scripture. And it just teaches me, you know, he didn't say, watch me so that you never have a temptation. He says, you don't fall into it. And so, um, you know, and temptation doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a drug or, or sexual thing. I mean, it could be, you know, you're tempted to think you're worthless or you're tempted to, you know, do or say and act in ways you shouldn't. Um, and, and just having that time, man, it just pulls you back in. Um, and, and, you know, for me, that's, that's just something I try to do every day um, is I try to just find that time because no matter what had happened the next day, no matter what worries I got going on in life, I can take those few moments and I can just let it all down and just pray and talk to God in, in a real raw form. And, and then I just allow him to speak back into me. Um, and when he does, man, it, it changes everything. You know, you could be having the worst day ever. And that moment of prayer and you leave out of that room and you just feel like you could conquer the world and, and you know that you can when God's on your side as long as you know uh, I heard one preacher say it can't get to you unless it goes through God and, and so that's why you know just just stay close to him uh, especially now you said it best now is uh, I told you know the the staff at our church I was talking to him about and told him you'll see probably a lot of people they may fall off because of this, you know, uh, they may not come back to church for a while and, and it'll be up to us that are close to God 
to go back and pull them in. But once we pull them back in, uh, teach them that, hey, you know, we won't always be here in this manner or we may not be able to meet. You know, we don't know. We didn't know coronavirus was coming, uh, but we surely are in the middle of it and, and having to deal with it. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to thank you so much, uh, Pastor Chris. For thank you us. for what you do. Oh, I've seen you on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah you can check it out too. awesome y'all are doing some awesome stuff i just want to tell you and your church man y'all are a blessing uh, i love all the stuff i'm seeing you guys are great wow, uh, you just keep you so doing much. things for the gospel man and, and i appreciate that as just someone that loves jesus just seeing people not give up man and just keep doing it i really appreciate that because it encourages me just to see you guys go amen amen well um again chris galloway is at the rock hill church is the associate pastor at Rock Hill Church. What's the address to Rock Hill for any Rock Hill people that watch this? You know? Yeah, you can follow them on Facebook. <laughs> I don't know. No, don't know. on Facebook. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have a Facebook page, uh, Harvest yeah. Ministries. Definitely. It's Harvest Ministries. Um, we have a website, harvestministries.cc. Um, and, you know, not stealing people, but, hey, check it out. You know, yeah. you would like it. Uh, yeah, we, have a great, we have a great pastoral staff you know uh senior pastor gary adkins man he's he's amazing and then uh associate pastor michael golden i don't know if you know mike golden he is he is just wonderful and his wife jenny she does children's ministry and women's ministry and then of course most people do know uh doctor i call we call him dr bishop uh ken baker mm -hmm. uh, he's one of the associates at the church and it's uh it's it's just a blessing and uh so so yeah, any of my friends that are in that area, yeah. go see them. Ask for uh, Chris Galloway. And uh, <laughs> yeah, check us out. Sometime. He'll take care of you. And, um, and they also they uh, have messages on their Facebook page, too. Um, and you can also go to their website and pull up some of their sermons and different things yeah. like that off of their website. So please check them out. Again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us, Pastor Chris. Um, thank you for watching this. Be on the lookout. Um, next week for another one of these we are excited about these we're trying to do them weekly for right now um, as, as long as we keep getting yeses we'll keep doing them weekly so we're going to keep pushing them out because I believe God has a word and um, and sometimes we have to travel outside to get these stories traveling stories um, to hear the word of God but thank you so much God bless you we love you and we will see you soon